I would like to talk about it. Uh, uh. Also, uh, we were interested only in the uh, networking virtualization um, uh, things related to open contracts. So, so it also involves the open stack because our use case was about data center uh, orchestration and network virtualization in these uh, data uh, centers. So I'd like to talk about this. Uh, today. Uh, what's the plan? I would like to talk, introduce a bit uh, an open stack. Uh, what is it? Why it has been invented? What problems it uh, it solves? And just take a, just talk a bit about this and then focus more on, on open contract which was uh, uh, the most work we uh, were doing actually and talk about why why it was also invented, why, uh, what kind of problems it uh, uh, solves and how it does it. So I'll try to uh, describe a bit the software architecture of, uh, of this. And at the, at the end of the presentation I'd like to uh, present the status and what are the next steps that has to be done. Why I'm talking about Open Contrail uh, today in this presentation is because one of the tasks uh, I was involved uh, was porting open contract to FreeBSD uh, because you may know these two uh, systems probably better OpenStack than Open Contrail, but they were they had been um, available only on the Linux platform, and we wanted to change it, and and actually we did it. So uh, uh, when it comes to the data center, we have something like picture uh, here. We have many uh, hypervisor which are physical uh, servers, physical machines, and we host many uh, virtual machines that uh, compound some user applications. When you are a cloud provider, you want to, you will have uh, plenty of users. Uh, each user may have plenty of virtual machines because they, uh, his application may involve uh, having a separate database on different machine, uh, some load balancing on different and this kind of things. So, so you'll end up having many virtual machines that will be transparent to the, your user. He will just like to um, use them as, an, as a, just a regular server. And uh, when you are uh, managing this kind of data center, you have to make a decision on which uh, hardware you want to run which v VM. It is important because because uh, given server may have not uh, enough resources to host yet another uh, VMs. And managing this kind of stuff uh, and setting up networking between those uh, VMs may be challenging and uh, and uh, something that uh, will manage this has to be uh, introduced. And we can see that uh, it is quite similar to what we see when we have one machine. We have also resources. We have CPU cores, we have uh, memory, we have storage, we have networking. And the operating system is doing man management of this uh, on our behalf. So, so this is exactly the same situation, but we have uh, many machines. And what was uh, created is an open stack. An open stack calls themselves that they are the cloud operating system. And I think they, they are pretty right because uh, this is actually what, uh, what it does. They divided it into, into three major functionalities, uh, the compute, the, the networking, and the storage. Uh, I'll focus on those two first, about compute and about networking. About compute because we have to have uh, ability to spawn a VM on a given machine, uh, so it is necessary. And networking because we were most interested in this, as Open Control is a solution, is external solution to uh, handle uh, complex scenarios and very large systems uh, 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 when you have to have uh, some kind of uh, flexibility uh, in terms of uh, configuring and managing uh, networking. So let's start with the, um, with the open stack. Uh, it's actually what I said uh, um, previously, that uh, they uh, aims to man manage those uh, three things. And the things about compute and storage has been, uh, had been already 
very well supported by OpenStack. But when it comes to networking, uh, the I don't know, the stack solution implemented in OpenStack is not uh, good if you have a large number of systems. It doesn't scale just so. So in terms of networking, you have to have something, extra, some external solution uh, that, will all, that will allow you to maintain your uh, data center and expansion of your data center. Uh, but uh, for the simple scenarios, uh, it uh, works very well. So we ported also the networking uh, inherently implemented in uh, in the OpenStack to FreeBSD, and also we ported the OpenContrail, which allows for more sophisticated uh, networks. The OpenStack uh, is composed of many many uh, components. Uh, the the most important one for the compute is Nova. It implements the all which is uh, necessary to schedule uh, a VM on a given, uh, on a given hardware and then uh, talk to the hypervisor and, and just spawn this VM. Uh, it also provides this networking uh, managing uh, facilities, but these are uh, in the case of these simple networking scenarios. Uh, Neutron is a component which provides uh, networking service that may be implemented by the external uh, systems such as Open Control via the plugins mechanism, and there is also others like Glance, which holds the images. Because if you want want to spawn a VM, you have to you have to fetch uh, the image from somewhere. So so there is plenty of other components, but uh, our interest and we we were we were focused on on this compute node uh, components because of. Uh, they uh, are the ones that are uh, dependent on the underlying platform because the rest, actually every component in OpenStack is written in Python and, and they are just using standard tools, standard libraries. So if you have this library, uh, you can just run it on any platform you want. But there are exceptions when you want to talk directly to the operating system like, for instance, the hypervisor. And since we have Beehive in FreeBSD now, we can use FreeBSD as as the underlying platform for the OpenStack. So I'll now try to focus on this compute now and, 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 and say a few words about that. Uh, uh, compute not works, uh, mm, it requires, uh, uh, d d maybe not, uh, it's like we have a hypervisor like Beehive and we have to uh, be able to control it. Uh, the simplest way is to use some abstraction like, like libvirt, which is fortunately uh, available on FreeBSD. We did some development around it, but, but the initial, initial part of uh, libvirt for FreeBSD and support for the Beehive uh, had already been done, so, so it uh, saves us uh, a lot of work. And this libvirt is uh, mm, controlled by the Nova Compute process, which is a Python, li a Python uh, daemon. Uh, which uh, which uh, just uh, uses the uh, bindings of the lib uh, library to spawn a VMs. And it also talks to another process, which is Nova Network, which is responsible for setting up networking. In this case, it creates bridges, it creates VLAN tags, associates uh, some addresses to, to the interfaces, uh, creates tab devices, and et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, and those three components are necessary, uh, and those uh, marked by violet color here uh, were necessary to, um, they are missed, I mean, not missed, but uh, they were not working on a FreeB platform. So all these three components has to be, uh, has to, has to be rewritten. Uh, but the main, in, in, term, uh, in terms of OpenStack components, there is this Nova Compute and Nova Network which we put uh, most of our effort. Uh, of course, it was also a libvirt, but the libvirt hasn't, uh, didn't require as much work as those, uh, those two. So Nova Compute is responsible, as I said previously, um, just by, to spawn and uh, destroy some VMs, and Nova Network is responsible for setting up uh, the networking. So how it actually works, uh, let's, try to analyze some example. When Nova Scheduler decides that this given VM should be spawned on this given uh, platform, uh, the Nova Compute on this uh, server fetches the image from the Glance service and builds uh, an XML description of the domain that is to be spawned. 
Uh, this XML is a little bit defined uh, thing that you have to create if you want to use a little bit to spawn the VM. Uh, in the meantime, Nova Network configures the bridges, configures uh, all which is necessary for the networking, and once the uh, libvirt spawns the VM, it puts the tab that corresponds to the interfaces uh, in, from inside the guest VM on the proper bridges, because each bridge means each virtual network in this, uh, in this case. So, uh, so this is a very simple, uh, simple scenario that uh, allows you to have, uh, to have uh, uh, some flexibility uh, upon spawning your VMs on different hosts and, and have some simple networking between them. Uh, just to summarize what we, uh, uh, up to now, what we did uh, in terms of development, it was, like I said before, Libvirt. Uh, it is work of Roman Bogorodicki, I hope I pronounce it correctly. Uh, he made uh, initial uh, part of the Beehive support uh, for the uh, for the libvirt and also he made some uh, some hacks around the QM, which is also uh, actually necessary by the Nova Compute to do some stuff like converting from one to another uh, image formats. Uh, we did some adjustments in the Nova Compute uh just to allow uh, it to uh to to use the beehive hypervisor because uh, the code which is responsible for um, ge generating the xml have to uh, has to take into account that we are now using different uh, different hyper, uh, hypervisor and there were some uh, things that uh, were linux specific like uh, mangling some things inside sysfs which we do not have in freebsd so so this was adjustments uh, done to the nova compute and when it comes to nova network uh, uh, it actually works uh, by um, executing command line tools on a given platform so uh, in the Linux case, it was just uh, bridge control and IP tools. Uh, we do not have this in FreeBSD, so we have to uh, write our <coughs> our driver, which will use uh, uh, if config for doing this stuff. Uh, also, there is a big difference in uh, executing DNS mask, which is uh, serving DHCP and DNS services for the VMs in this uh, in this case. So we also have to. Uh, made some uh, modifications to this code. And the last but not least is a dev stack. Dev stack is a script, a huge script, that is um, supposed to uh, install, configure, and run the entire OpenStack cluster. Uh, if, you, if you run um, the OpenStack cluster entirely on one host, it would consist of more than 20 uh, processes. Each of them has to be properly uh, installed, configured, and executed. So this is what DevStack does. Uh, and of course, there are no support for FreeBSD. And unfortunately, it's a bit pain to work with DevStack because there is a lot of ifs, there are a lot of differences between even flavors of, of Linux distributions. Like if you have Fedora or Centor or Ubuntu, there are different packages may be named differently and you have to uh, cope with this. We have totally different uh, things in FreeBSD. So, so it is, unfortunately, it is still diverging. We haven't uh, we haven't yet uh, merged it uh, upstream to the dev stack or code, so so it uh, all the time is diverging because there are some changing some things and it broke ours. So it's a bit of pain, but we have to have something that is uh, able to easily set up a cluster just, uh, for example, for the development purposes. So that was uh, uh, that was what we did in terms of OpenStack. We created this uh, uh, port of Nova Compute and Nova uh, Nova Network. But our goal was to have more sophisticated ways of uh, networking. So we uh, now uh, uh, went to uh, the Open Contrail, which is actually serving this networking part of the OpenStack. And let's uh, have a closer look about what we have in the typical rag in the data center. We have a switch uh, which connects to those physical machines, and inside of these uh, physical machines we have those VMs. So uh, 
we see that the, even if we have only one physical endpoint, networking points, we may have several virtual logical endpoints associated uh, because we have several machines running on this uh, host. And this is only one rack. In reality, we'll, you will have much more racks, much more servers, and you have to uh, provide net network connectivity between them. And if it comes to the physical network connectivity, this is an example of top of rack architecture, you use a um, typical close uh, uh, network architecture to connect each of the uh, of the uh, uh, physical host to, to each other. So it looks like you, we have uh, now the problem of the physical connectivity is done. But the, the virtual endpoints may migrate from one host to another host, it may be in one rack, then later in other rack. So the packets for this virtual uh, endpoints has to cross uh, over this physical um, physical networks, and uh, it uh, may not be as easy as it uh, seems because it may in involve in the typical scenario it may involve uh, necessity of uh, reconfiguration of the switch and so on. So what we can observe is that uh, the, the very important observation is that the uh, in in contemporary. Uh, data center installations, the majority of the endpoints are virtual, so we need to take special care of this. And we have to, uh, mm, we, we have, to have an isolation between them because you may have several users, user may have uh, want to uh, have uh, isolation between his front end or back end uh, uh, system in his applications, whatever. So we have to provide all this and we don't want to change the physical uh, 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 network uh, when this it is doing because we want to build a data center and then uh, let users decide what uh, they want to do with this so we would not to uh, we don't like to uh, have to, to, to be forced to do some uh, hardware changes to that and uh, there are some solutions, there's many solutions. I would like to present two of them. One is the bridges and VLANs, which is what actually does OpenStack by default. That's uh, what I was talking about previously. And the other is uh, the overlay uh, networking, which is what Open Contrail is uh, doing. Uh, I'll try to uh, compare them, and now, and uh, in a minute, we'll see why. Uh, the latter is much better solution. Let's stick with VLANs. Uh, when we have a VLANs, we just put uh, VMs on, on the host and, and identify the net, uh, virtual networks by VLAN tags and bridges. Uh, we have a limit here, so if we uh, want to have more than uh, 4096, uh, we'll hit a problem. We can, of course, uh, overcome is using shorter path bridging, but uh, but it is not very flexible, difficult to manage, and and what's uh, important, the physical switches, those, there may be a lot of them, they may be very uh, expensive, has to keep a state of the virtual networks in the, st in, in the system. Uh, why is that? Let's take a, a simple example. We have a three servers here, server one, two, and three, and have VMs on each. And I uh, distinguished uh, different virtual networks by color. So we have uh, here red and blue virtual network. And let's assume you want to send packet from VM1, this uh, in the top left corner, to the VM9, so blue network, which is at the bottom. So what we'll see on the wire is that we'll see uh, Ethernet MAC address, uh, VLAN tag and IP of the VM9. And this packet will hit the switch. And this switch has to know uh, on which port this uh, VM is now connected. Because the switch uh, by our protocol knows where the physical hosts are connected. But if we put on the wire the uh, IP address of the virtual network, it also has to somehow know uh, that it has to put this packet to the port 3. The problem is when uh, the VM9 migrates from server 3 to server 2. Then the switch uh, has to now no longer uh, forward uh, packets to the VM9 to the server 3, but to port 3, but uh, it has to forward it to the port 2. 
So somehow it has to um, get uh, know uh, that this happened, that this migration has happened. Of course, we know the migration happened because we have the OpenStack uh, orchestration system, and he decides uh, where the VM is uh, now located. So the information is, but it has to be somehow uh, uh, propagated to the to these physical switches, all switches that uh, takes part in the root of the packet. There are solutions for this. For instance, uh, standard uh, OpenFlow uh, tries to uh, standardize the way how these controllers can talk to the switches and then uh, do it automatically when, when the VM migrates, uh, it can reconfigure the switch. But it, it is some solution, but there is a better solution which uh, OpenContrail provides and it is based on the overlay networking. It is by no means new technology. It has been known f uh, for, uh, by the industry for years, but its uh, utilization in data center is relatively new. And what it does, it separates uh, the physical and the logical or virtual networks uh, uh, mm, from each other. Uh, the physical underlying network is called by in the open control nomenclature IP fabric and it contains no tenant state. You have no st information about virtual networks, about anything uh, in the physical, uh, physical network. Every state information except gateways, but maybe about this uh, a bit later on. Uh, Mm, all the state information is contained in the virtual overlay uh, networking. And OpenContrail uses MPLAs over GRIV, VXLAN, and MPLAs over UDP uh, types of, of tunneling because these overlay networks are created as uh, tunnels between, uh, between the VMs. So let's go back to the same example, but now let's see what happens when we have an overlay network. So if VM tries to uh, reach VM, VM1 tries to reach VM9, uh, the V rotors, the, mm, the software in this, uh, uh, in this server one uh, hypervisor, it encapsulates the packets for the VM9 with the header uh, of the physical server three. Because, uh, as I previously mentioned, that uh, this information is available in the controller, we don't have to. Uh, we we know this because uh, we have components of the entire system in those hypervisors in the software. So we know that that this VM is now running on the server three. So we encapsulate our packet to VM nine uh, with the header of the uh, S three server and put it to the uh, network. Uh, this is just Ethernet and IP uh, uh, network, so the switch, uh, when once the physical uh, server was connected to the network, switch learned uh, using ARP where are which uh, servers, so it doesn't have, so it knows where to put packets on which port, and when the uh, when the VM migrates from one uh, server three to server two we still have the same uh, VM, uh, we, we don't have uh, any longer the same packet like it was in the previous example with VLAN, because now we, we know that this, uh, this VM is on the server too, so we put S2 Ethernet header physical, so we encapsulate it with S2 Ethernet Eternal, uh, and IP uh, headers, and this is just uh, sent to the physical switch, physical switch knows where is physical, uh, physical host, so it forwards it to port 2, and the packet uh, reaches uh, the server, which is now currently, which is currently hosting uh, VM9. Uh, there are clear advantages of this, uh, of this uh, solution, uh, because the knowledge about network is only in the software. So you, you have the knowledge about virtual networks, the state of the virtual network is in the controller or in the compute nodes uh, uh, components. And what is uh, really nice is that uh, any switch will work for the IP fabric. You don't have to have any means of configuration this switch. And any switch will work uh, only speed matters, actually. If it is uh, faster, it is better. And if it doesn't have to have any uh, sophisticated configuration uh, uh, possibilities, then it may be of lower price than, than, than the former one. And uh, 
in case of this, uh, uh, in case of open control, this whole process is based on the standard uh, protocols, which makes it very easy to interoperate with uh, existing equipment in the data center. So let's see how the open control is uh, built. Uh, here is a an architectural overview of the entire open control system. Uh, from the mm, highest altitude, it is actually composed of two things. One thing are the forwarding, uh, forwarding plane, uh, which is a V router, and it is available on every compute node, because compute nodes are the machines that actually are uh, used to spawn the VMs, but they have to have some components, and the, the, the v, v router uh, forwarding plane is put on every hypervisor, on every on every uh, server that is hosting any VMs. And the second uh, uh, component is uh, is a controller, which, of course, is built from different, uh, different uh, uh, components. I'll talk about them in a second. Uh, but, uh, but we may distinguish those two things. This controller uh, itself is centralized, but it is logically centralized and physically is distributed. It allows uh, for scalability because every component of the controller uh, works in an active, active manner. So, so if you are lacking of resources or something like this, you just spawn another VM because components of this controller may be also uh, in the VM or maybe in the physical server. So you may add another hardware and everything, everything just scale out uh, very easy. So let's... Uh, uh, walk through a bit through those uh, components. Uh, at the very top, we have a configuration node, and the main, the main, uh, uh, the task for the configuration node is to uh, provide the API uh, for the user or for the orchestrator. In in this case, when you use OpenStack, you use Neutron and Plugin, which will talk to the uh, configuration node, and it will be talking uh, using very high-level uh, mm, description. So uh, you just want this VM, VM1 and VM2, ones in the virtual networks, uh, network A. You want to allow virtual network A connectivity to virtual network B, for instance. You allow virtual machine 3 to uh, be not uh, to outside the world or something like this. You use very high level description primitives to, uh, to describe the state of the system. And this state of the system is held in the database. Uh, it's Cassandra in the case of Open Control. It is also, it, it was choose because it is uh, easily scalable. So if you are lacking from, uh, if you are lacking, you can, uh, of, of plays or, or the performance, then you may uh, put some load balancing or do sharding of the database without any problems. Uh, so this is Cassandra uh, in case of Open Control. Uh, the REST API server is, of course, uh, serving the API, so, so it is uh, receiving the request from the uh, orchestrator. And the very important thing is the schema transformer. It is um, actually uh, some kind of compiler. It compiles from this high-level uh, description of, of the networking and entire system state to more lower level uh, um, primitives like routing instance, like next hop, etc., etc. Because uh, this schema transformer makes uh, it uh, uh, transformation from the description what we want to achieve to the description how we want to achieve on in this given uh, uh, system cluster we. Uh, we made. And Open Control uses IFMAP to broadcast this information to the control nodes. Uh, so if, if something is changing, uh, user changes configuration, uh, IFMAP server will broadcast it to the control, uh, control nodes. And control nodes are responsible for, uh, for setting up actual uh, forwarding um, base information uh, and uh, communicating those into the compute nodes. Uh, it uses XMPP for this purpose, uh, and it also uh, uh, gets some information from the compute nodes, like uh, if they if 
uh, he decides to proxy some uh, some protocols like uh, let's say ARP, uh, DNS, or DHCP. Uh, besides the communication with the compute nodes, uh, there is also uh, the each control node communicates with other control nodes using BGP protocol and it can communicate with uh, regular hardware equipment. Uh, so any switch that understands NetConf or, uh, NetConf or BGP also can, can communicate with control nodes so they can exchange their routing informations and cooperate uh, very smoothly. Uh, of course, there is a lot of control nodes, uh, at least two, uh, I mean, at, at we, one compute node connects to at least two for redundancy uh, reasons, and there is, all of those control nodes are active, so if one goes down, the other um, automatically take care of the uh, job that the first one did, so, so we are very fault tolerant uh, with this. But now we come to the most important uh, uh, node, which is the compute node, and which actually requires uh, some work uh, when we try to use it on the FreeBSD platform. Uh, it is, this is a similar picture I presented when I was talking about the uh, open stack compute node. It's almost the same. We have Nova Compute, we have Libvirt, and we have Beehive and VMs. So this, is, this hasn't changed. But now we have uh, some new components. We have a Nova Viv driver, which is, uh, which is uh, supposed to communicate the state of the VMs, which is known by the Nova Compute from the open stack controller to the control again because he wants to know which port should uh, uh, should be uh, uh, or which type device is associated with which VM. He has to know this in order to, to connect the correct VM to the correct uh, virtual network. And there is a control agent which is a user space uh, process and it is actually uh, sort of part, distributed part of the control node. Uh, it actually handles uh, the proxies of ARP and uh, DHCP because uh, this kind of protocols are not broadcasted over, not sent over the IP fabric network, but are handled inside the compute node uh, just here. And uh, the main, um, main task of the control agent is to communicate with the uh, view router which is a kernel module and uh, the view router doesn't have any information any intelligence itself it just has a forwarding tables uh, flow tables and this kind of stuff and it just puts packets from one port to another port or from one vm to another vm does encapsulation and this kind of uh, stuff it is controlled by the uh, agent and and they communicate uh, with Jojo using Netlink. Netlink is a Linux uh, thing, uh, not available in FreeBSD. Uh, but fortunately, the communication between agent and the view router was only uh, mm, were using Netlink, but uh, wasn't is not using any sophisticated fa features of the Netlink, just the headers and the transmission control. So, so we are using just the same headers and using the sequence numbers to acknowledge that this uh, uh, parts of the uh, communication has been uh, received by the view router or by the by the agent. And there is something like the flow, uh, which is just a, uh, just a memory sharing be mm, region between the agent and view router, and it is used for the flow tables because flow tables are mm, hash tables, and and both agent and view router wants to has a quick access to them to quickly find w which flow should go where. So so uh, it is uh, those hash tables are shared. Uh, by the agent and by the view router via uh, the flow. And there is a uh, PKTA device, which is just a type device, and it's used when the new flow is discovered. So if a uh, view router wants to send a packet uh, of a new flow, so the first packet of each flow is sent to agent, and then agent sets up, if there is no uh, uh, proper flow uh, already set up in the view router, then it sends up to uh, send it up to the agent, and the agent uh, agent sets up correct flows and communicates about new flow to the controller and 
etc., etc. So this is uh, this is those uh, elements uh, again here marked in the violet color. This all has to be uh, uh, or written, ported, or modified uh, in order to make them work in the FreeBSD uh, case. Uh, what we actually support in the FreeBSD is only one uh, uh, mode of operation, and it is the tunneling via MPLS over uh, GRE. And I would like to um, show a very similar example of what we have been talking, what we uh, talked before uh, during when I uh, told, about, told about the overline networks. And this is a very similar example, but it is much more concrete. Because uh, we have all these uh, nodes uh, I have been already spoken, so we have the configuration node, control node, and compute nodes here. And uh, how it all works? When we have a VM, and VM is spawned on the server one uh, here on the left, then uh, it informs uh, that uh, informs the controller that uh, the VM with uh, IP address ten one 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 should be, uh, it just sets up the next uh, hop for this uh, VM and with the physical address of the server. That way the controller knows that once somebody would like to reach this VM of address 10.1.1.1, it has to send packets, uh, uh, packets should be sent encapsulated in the 70.10.10.1 uh, address and MPLS uh, label number 39 should be uh, should be uh, put in the MPLS header. Uh, the same is for the server too, but different, uh, of course, different uh, IP addresses, different uh, labels. And then, if uh, VM1 from server one uh, wants to reach VM on the server two, it looks in his forwarding table and he sees that next hop for 10.1.1.2 is uh, one five one ten ten one, uh, so he knows it has to encapsulate it in the jury and MPL and add MPLS tag number seventeen, and that's what we see on the network actually. And when this packet uh, arrives to the server two, uh, it is decapsulated by the vRouter. This MPLS la label identifies the virtual network where the VM is uh, connected to. This is quite uh, a nice thing because those uh, labels are local to the compute nodes and to the virtual networks on these compute nodes. So even though there is limit of MPLS nodes uh, numbers, we probably doesn't reach it because it is local, it's not global like it was in the VLAN case that we have 4,096 uh, tags and we were using, they were mm, just uh, used globally and those are uh, things that are, that matters only locally so so we may never uh, reach end of this actually so, so this also helps uh, with the scalability of the system. There is also yet another note uh, which is, which is uh, uh, part of the Open Contrail solution, and it is analytics node. It doesn't take uh, presence uh, in the actual transmission of the packets or deciding where uh, how how it works, but it is very uh, useful in terms of analytics, in terms of debugging, because each uh, each uh, event uh, that uh, occurs in the open control system is reported to the analytics node they have here some rules engine which is just very simple mabridus uh, uh, mabridus uh, uh, pattern that uh, can get any information you they have they have special query language for this and you can just extract the information about how many packets uh, were transmitted at given time in the given virtual network or how many reached this given virtual machine how many of them <coughs> were uh, encapsulated with uh, what kind of uh, stuff everything what you want to do uh, want to know is available via this analytics node so it is uh, very very nice thing, but uh, this analytics node controller and compute nodes are uh, as it was in the OpenStack uh, case, 
just an user space application is not necessarily uh, mm, dependent on the underlying platform. So from our point of view, the compute node was, was the most uh, uh, important one and most interesting for us. And uh, for the FreeBSD development, we just uh, created a new uh, model uh, of VRotor. There are some, uh, there are some mm, common parts in this, uh, like GPCar, which is uh, uh, which takes care of, uh, of the encapsulation, decapsulation, the, this kind of stuff, and everything else went to the FreeBSD uh, subdirectory. Uh, when it comes to agent development, uh, there were some differences between IOCTLs, tab device manipulations in FreeBSD and Linux, so we have to do this. We have to change the shared memory, the dev flow device they use on the Linux, we just use a regular file and mapped uh, between the uh, vRouter and the uh, agent. And we have to create a listener. Listener is a model that uh, uh, learns about changes of the network states in the host. They use Netlink for this, but we don't have Netlink, so we use pfroot for this, and we have to implement this uh, from scratch. And in order to make it sense, uh, we have to make a lot of refactoring uh, to abstract the, th the differences between names of the, uh, the fields in, in structures of network headers or something like this. There are differences between Linux and FreeBSD, and we have to care, take care about this and, and abstract out uh, most of this uh, stuff. And what has left to be done still? We need some LibVirt improvements because um, current support in LibVirt is uh, not very uh, not very complete. We only can spawn the FreeBSD machines at the moment, actually. We need some OpenStack uh, improvements, uh, uh, but we are here dependent on what LibVirt actually does. So, so at the first place, we have to uh, put some effort in uh, LibVirt. We do not uh, uh, support firewall in, in Nova. Uh, because uh, uh, current implementation allows only for uh, IP tables, we have PF, IPAV, and IP filter, but we haven't done it yet. And uh, we still, if you want to use it, you still have to uh, use our fork of Nova. We need to uh, complete all the stuff because OpenStack doesn't want to integrate uh, if the support is not complete, they don't want to integrate it into their official repositories. Uh, we also doesn't support MPDs over UDP and VXLANs, which are supported on the Linux platform. So this is also this also has to be done, and a lot of work has to be put in the automatic provisioning, so into DevStack and Contra installer scripts, because uh, they on the FreeBSD are still suffering from from many uh, from many issues, and that's actually all I all I have prepared. If somebody have any questions, I'll be happy to answer. Yep. Hi, yeah, thank you for your talk. Um, do you have any uh, ETA in mind or when you think you're going to get this production ready and integrated with the OpenStack? What, what do you mean by ETA? ETA, estimated time of arrival. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, so, so the Open Control is already uh, merged uh, into official repositories, so it is available there. You have to have forks of mm, OpenStack components because they have uh, not yet been integrated. Uh, but the, this is all available on the GitHub, uh, so you can just uh, take it and, uh, and try it by, uh, by yourself. But unfortunately, it may not be as easy without some, some fiddling with some things, especially when it comes to this uh, provisioning scripts and dev stack. But the rest is, uh, is there and you can, you can use it. So I don't know how many free cycles we'll be have because we are now focused on, on different uh, development in the open control, not this one related to the FreeBSD pod. It was just one task, but, uh, but we'll try to, uh, to complete and somehow get this stuff merged to, to upstream and have it supported uh, everywhere. Yep. So do <clears throat> um, you know there's already work being done to uh, get VXLAN on FreeBSD, so there's someone actually currently working on that? No. Okay, so I'll know. connect you with them later. And the other question I had is, in the earlier network example where you said that you, so you create all these MPLS tunnels or GRE tunnels or mm -hmm. whatever you're doing, 
which is incredibly wasteful of bandwidth. Um, so why don't you simply use a gratuitous ARP to update the switch? Sorry, we, could, you, could you repeat? Because I If you move a virtual machine, yeah. and you know you've moved a virtual machine, yeah. and you've taken an action on your own part, so you could actually poison your old ARP entry to the switch by doing a gratuitous ARP. You could tell the switch, instead of creating a million tunnels. I don't, I don't. Well, I believe OpenStack is doing this because uh, they, they have to manage uh, the interfaces through the firewalls, and their virtual interfaces are not visible to the, their firewalls, so they have to bridge it always. And their, mm -hmm. I mean, it's very hard to change it because it's uh, running normally on Linux, and uh, they're just following the Linux way. So if we fork it and start changing it, probably it will be a nightmare for us to keep it. Okay, so thank you very much.